it's time for the q and a session uh, i i would like to ask the speakers to to open the the camera and there are several questions Let, let's start with teresa casanovas teresa please go ahead with your question teresa you're on mute yeah, so if there is, uh, in the meantime, let's start asking a question to, to Pierre, to Pierre Naon. Uh, what are the barriers for identification of cirrhosis in primary care at a population level and how could they overcome, Pierre? Could you comment on that? Yeah, that's a very good question, Maria. Uh, I think I, I showed you that this uh, algorithm uh, that can be used in primary care are uh, easy to use but complex uh, to calculate and this is one of my uh, I would say a uh, 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 question is and, and can be answered by uh, some other uh, members of the panel uh, we must be convinced first that it is useful for the patients so we must convince biologists to automatically calculate this algorithm and provide it to the general practitioner. So he doesn't have to uh, think and calculate this algorithm. And when he received the results of the laboratory, this is a very pragmatic question. He has the, the result and he says, oh, you have diabetes, but you may also have liver fibrosis. So go to the liver clinic. And this is how we can have, and I really enjoyed uh, uh, Parta Bazou uh, slide showing the complexity of framing of this intervention because we are convinced as doctors we can easily convince other doctors but as a community it takes it will takes a lot of time and and, and action to uh, put in, uh, in in clinical perspective so clearly this this is why we need politics now uh, it's not a matter of science it's a matter of, of politics and let's go for it let's, uh, but uh, it takes time Thank you, thank you, Pierre. Uh, Mr. Basud, do you like to comment on this? Do, do, you, do you like to add your point of view? Thank you. I think that's the most important issue to be settled at this point of time. I mean, we all agree that there is a good test. It does uh, uh, you know, uh, reduce, improve survival and then quality of life. And it may be even cost-effective in many settings. But most important thing is the implementation challenges. And the implementation challenges, when we're looking at th thinking of a barriers, we think of at three levels. First, what are the barriers for the patients or, or the population, general population, to access care? Then is the, what are the barriers at the level of the primary healthcare providers? Maybe the primary healthcare providers, they are not uh, trained enough. They have never been exposed to see a, 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 a liver... Uh, you know, disease, it's quite possible because some of the primary care, we have to understand they see a variety of patients, which is a very mix of uh, all kinds of diseases. So from the perspective of the provider, there may be as, uh, some challenges, but most important challenge is the system level challenges. System level challenges is like, you know, what? Uh, 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 if somebody does have a problem, do they know where to go? I mean, is there a, 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 an appropriate opportunity for that person to reach the appropriate hospital, which will be providing appropriate guidance on the liver disease? Or, or if somebody is already having a liver disease and requires appropriate surveillance, is there a structured surveillance mechanism available in the country or the area? So we need to think of all these three aspects and a good barrier assessment study is always very, very valuable to understand this, which does not require much of resources, but then one has to look at all these aspects. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, we, we have these tools, but probably we can increase awareness and, and education uh, and spread uh, the, the tools that, that we have. Now let's move to Teresa Casanovas. Are you ready, Teresa? Thank you, yes. I would like to announce that the next 26th of October, next week, ELPA joining with DICE, which is an association of digestive cancer in Europe, uh, is launching the white paper on liver cancer. 
this is an important document, not only from the point of view of the scientifics, but for all the citizens in Europe, because this is a document comprehensive with the, all the assessment and possible solutions in each step of the process of liver cancer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, for, for this comment. There is a question from the chat, just to mix a live and chat question about if there is any collection of consolidated statistics regarding liver fibroscan by anyone, anywhere, that can then be analyzed by country, region, age, gender results, perhaps uh, Pierre or, or Maria, perhaps one of you can answer this, this question. Uh, I, I am not aware of any um, uh, efforts, at, at least at the multi-centric or European efforts, uh, but this kind of databases, mostly you have cohorts of patients. It's difficult to hear. Yeah, you hear me? Yes, yeah. better. I am not aware of uh, multicentric efforts at the European level uh, on this matter, but you have several cohorts in different countries that can be uh, 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 accessed. So Maria, if Maria or Ray, if you have uh, any comment for this. Yes, I believe that at this day, there are not a final result for any of this collection. This is a European project that it could be, uh, it could have this information in the future, but it's not available at this day, at least from my point of view, or my no. Thanks. There is a question for, for Milan. It's regarding the, the patient representative, and the question is about why do, do we need patient representative uh, car givers and car managers to be involved in, in all the process. What is the, the role of the patient representative? And I think Marco also can ask the, this question if, if he wants. So thank you very much for the floor. Yes, I think that throughout this, uh, all presentations today, it's clearly, and especially from Professor Basu, it's clearly noted that we need all stakers, uh, stakeholders at the table and we need the will of the recognition of the general public that this is an important issue and we need to solve it on the systemic level because the evidence is here, the, the doctors are interested, so the patients are interested, so we just need the next step and the next step would be to involve the people who are really making a decision as we are doing now today. Amila. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Maria. Uh, I have a question to Barbara. Uh, how you notice we have uh, dedicated in my country for early, early detection. Uh, oh, my video, sorry. Uh, early detection was uh, the primary goal in our declaration and uh, uh, we started with a study and uh, we like also to see the opportunities now around Europe uh, to find the partners also for prepare, especially from the European uh, Union uh, countries, uh, which uh, will do something similar and uh, to compare all the results maybe, and to find out uh, where's the biggest burning uh, gaps in the early detection. Uh, this study is already supported from uh, European Liberal Patient Association and some other uh, European uh, stakeholders. But my question is to Barbara, uh, do this kind of uh, initiative uh, uh, through the Horizon program can be possible to be applied and uh, to find a way to together with ESEL, like one of the biggest uh, scientific community in Europe, uh, to find, uh, let's say, a uh, bigger impact uh, to the early detection uh, in the next period. Because if we know that uh, COVID-19 situation is still ongoing, that means that we will have uh, problems. Uh, thank you for that question. And, and before answering your question, I just wanted to uh, um, react also of, uh, on the um, question on the importance of uh, patient involvement or patient representative involvement. There are two, uh, two, two, two 
first of all, it's important to know what matters to, to, to patients, uh, what is acceptable to patients, and what is uh, desirable for people that not yet have uh, cancer in order to for them not only to, to be able to, to uh, make themselves available for a screening program and, and understand the importance for it. So there are very different reasons why patient involvement is informed. You all know about research that was robust in terms of science, but not really, the results were not applicable because for example, the, te the technology developed did not meet uh, the requirements of the health professional, for example, the surgeon or the radiologist. So getting the end users involved in the design of the research is important and getting the end users uh, involved in, in awareness raising, it, 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 it improves the quality of the awareness raising. So I just, and that's why also I pointed out that for the missions, it, we, we really make this uh, uh, consistent effort to, to, to involve patients uh, in, 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 the, in the research, in the monitoring. Um, and I will also wanted to all of you to make you aware, I assume that uh, my colleague John Ryan this morning uh, made uh, reference to the stakeholder platform that has been set up uh, for the beating plan, cancer plan and the mission. So there you can register and participate in events. And then to come back to the question on, on the research opportunities, so there we have a um, funder and tenders portal. That is what is um, uh, where, where you can see the, the research that will be published, the, the topics that will be published, but you can also uh, look for partners. So there's a facility where you enter your name, uh, the research you're interested in, uh, and then uh, you, you can look for um, uh, additional partners. So that, that, that usually works well. Uh, and I uh, also wanted to uh, say that in, in terms of the governance of the mission and the beating cancer plan, there's the SGPP subgroup where you have representatives from different ministries participating. So you can draw your attention to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for highlighting the importance of the patients' organizations and the patient uh, representatives. Um, following with this, um, I would like to ask, what are the gaps that you can see in, in the liver cancer program? And this is a question also for you, Barbara, and for Mr. Basu. Um, I, I think, and that's why I was referring to, we realized that with, with the new technologies developing, uh, that there are probably new methods that need to be developed to make the, the, the early detection of cancer in general and liver cancer uh, in, in particular uh, more, 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 more efficient. Uh, and in parallel, I, I think this was pointed out by several of you, uh, we need to work on the implementation of, of the screening programs that, that could exist because there's knowledge there, things are feasible, but we need a, a, a combined effort uh, to, to be able to implement the screening programs that have been um, identified as, as, as uh, good screening programs. And there, and the, the, the other point that I want also to draw your attention to, but you're fully aware of that, is of course that it's the member states themselves that, that uh, decide on the way they will do screening at the help either through a full blown screening program or through uh, individual uh, health professionals participating in screening programs. So there's a responsibility, there's also advocacy to be done inside your countries. And I think uh, uh, North Macedonia is a good example of how things can be changed when you work at both levels, if you will. Uh, Pata, do you like to add uh, something? Just to add, uh, you know, that. You know, what we learned from Europe uh, and in implementing colorectal cancer screening, breast cancer screening or cervical cancer screening is the importance of doing pilot. You know, we don't make a decision overnight to go for a, a screening program throughout, say, for example, France. We need to do a piloting in a small uh, population, make, learn lessons from that, and then think of, uh, you know, expanding in a, in a stepwise manner. So I think that that kind of you know mindset setting and then that that kind of thinking will also help when we are thinking of liver cancer screening of the high risk population. Go for a pilot and then learn lessons from that implementation lessons and then think of 
Uh, I think Pierre uh, wants to, to do a comment. And I, I think also you can ask uh, the question from, from the chat about MRI as a tool for a screening or what will be the best tools uh, currently available for, for a screening. Pierre. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, I wanted to uh, respond and, and comment with you uh, uh, Dr. Basu and, and uh, Dr. Kastians, about this implementation of new technologies to improve screening, as I showed you. And, but you partially answered my, my question, which is, uh, should we first begin with national projects, then go to Europe, or should we uh, already launch uh, large trials? Because the caveat here is, is it takes time. If you want to meet an endpoint, which is basically, uh, for example, as I showed you with MRI, what we are conducting in France, it will be a six to eight years time frame to complete the trial. And so hopefully if the trial is positive, go to Europe to, uh, uh, to uh, confirm the results, or should we already as a European community uh, launch a dedicated programs to uh, improving uh, liver cancer surveillance? So what is your, uh, what would be your advice on this? just working on each different countries then come back to europe or already launch a very large and, and ambitious project to improve uh, surveillance programs what is your uh, opinion for this dr castens would you like to go first okay um you know this the, the, you know when we are thinking in terms of bringing in some new strategy, both aspects are important. One, as I said, about piloting the, 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 the intervention. I mean, when we say piloting, we pilot with what we have. We don't think of bringing in new things or we, we, we pilot with what, where we have already evidence that it has worked, uh, it is feasible, it is acceptable. And then we, we do the pilot and then we learn about the implementation challenges. But parallelly, it's also important to continue and support research. As you say, you know, the, the, maybe at some point of time, we'll have an even better uh, uh, tool that will uh, help us to uh, shift from one uh, type of uh, intervention to another type of intervention. Just to give you a, a classic example is that, you know, cervical cancer screening went on for years, so many years with uh, pap smear cytology. It did work. It, it's not that it didn't work. It did work. But then when we came to know that there was a much better test, which is HPV detection test is available. And then you see uh, gradually all the countries are transitioning. So it's, it's medical science is very dynamic. We, do, we learn as we move. That doesn't mean that we stop and then just say, no, let us wait for 10 years for another randomized control trial to come up with, with uh, results. So that will be my response to you, Pierre. Yes, and if I may come in, indeed, like uh, Bartha was saying, there's a difference between implementing a program based on evidence that exists, and, and then it's better to, to, to start as a pilot. Does it really work in practice? And uh, the research that provides the evidence is saying uh, this could work. And for the research, it's true, like you were saying, it's like uh, for, for rare diseases as well. If you can work across countries, you will, your equipment will be more efficient. So in that sense, uh, working at, at, uh, at the European level for, for, for the research makes sense because you can gather the necessary evidence for your trial um, more quickly than if you do it uh, uh, in your own country alone. Uh, Maria. You have shown that we can work in uh, European level. You have provided some examples. So Maria, can you tell us what are the, the gaps and, and, and how to overcome these, these gaps, particularly for implementation of the surveillance? Yes, Maria, my comment and, and I also answer the question is in, in this line. I believe that for, for screening, we already have the data and we know that it's not possible to improve the evidence that we have at this day. So the key thing is the implementation. And that's why I finished my presentation with the SEC project that is a screening program where we decided to change the strategy because we know that the patients know that they are at risk. We know that the physicians know, but we need to improve the adherence for that. 
and to also engage the radiology to perform the ultrasound with the quality that we, we need. And that's why we consider the nurses as the key person for that. The patients are more confident with patients. They are close uh, to them. And I believe that the gap is implementation and restructure the, the um, patient um, shortener for uh, implementation of the screen. This is my, my personal point of view. Thank you. I think this has been a, a great discussion. Um, we have discussed that we have the, the tools, the, the tools available, but we need to increase awareness. We need to increase uh, education, collaboration, and probably all, all of this help in implementation of the surveillance that at the end is, is the key issue. I, I would like to, to, to go to pass the the the, um, the the micro to to, to Thomas to Thomas Berg uh, to to close the the meeting and to give the summary remarks. Yes, thank you very much, Maria. Um, perhaps you can open my video. It's still blocked, and I think I will hand over first to Marco, who would also like to give a. Uh, some concluding remarks, and then I will follow. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Yes, just just uh, just a brief thank you to all the participants, all the panelists. Uh, a big thank you also for Slovenian government to show us that this is an issue that is of an interest of the highest level of European Union, uh, as Slovenia is the president's country now. Um, I wish to express also thank you to uh, Professor Buti, uh, Professor Maticic for the excellent second part of this meeting. And I do hope that we will meet uh, regularly and uh, measure the, the results that are definitely influencing the liver cancer patients in Europe. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Marco. So coming to my concluding remarks, and of course, first of all, I really want to give my special thanks to the Slovenian institutions and here especially to the University Medical Center of Ljubljana, to you, Moika, to the Slovenian Society of Infectious Diseases, and a special thank really to all the representatives of the European institution and the WHO for their support. Um, a special thank also to the courageous patients advocates who carry their concern sometimes also, yeah, a very important voice as we all are aware. And then a special thanks to all colleagues from ELPA, to you, Marco, the president of ELPA, and all colleagues from EASL for their commitment today and every day, and especially to you, Maria Buti, our head of the Public Health and Policy Council. So what to conclude, um, from of this high level event. And I think we have clear evidence that liver cancer numbers are increasing. But what the meeting showed is that there's also evidence that both prevention and early detection of liver cancer is feasible. And not only feasible, but can be improved. And I think liver cancer may even serve as a model for cancer prevention strategies in general. It's not unlikely that prevention measures that primarily target liver cancer can be associated with a reduction in the global cancer risk because of the common risk factors. And the magnitude of this effect may perhaps be greater than we are now realizing. So with the help of all of you, all stakeholders and partners with whom we are gathered here today, liver cancer prevention, screening, early diagnosis, but also improving inequalities in care of patients with liver cancer in the EU can become a reality. And I would like to name it the hepatology community with EASL, ELPA, the patient community, their families have not only the tools, but also the will to make this reality. So to conclude, to save lives, we really need to push for the updated council recommendation on cancer screening to also include liver cancer. 
The current draft report of the Beijing Cancer Committee on the implementation of the Europe's Cancer Plan recommends in its amendment 623 that member states roll out quality assured programs for early detection also of liver cancer. And this is really a big success and we thank to all those who have contributed. However, we must double our advocacy efforts and make sure that these amendments stayed in the final report. I thank you all, wish you a good day and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.